Hi, welcome and thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Stephanie and I'm going to be moderating today's online chat with the experts. Uh, I do want to acknowledge before we start that this was a very sad weekend for the Pacific Whale Foundation Ohana. Uh, our founder, Greg Kaufman, passed away on Saturday. Uh, all the research we're discussing today stems from what he started in 1980 and our researchers are proud and honored to carry on in his legacy. Uh, so today's chat is dedicated to Greg. And I'd like to introduce the participants. Um, Jenny, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Jenny. I'm the conservation assistant here at the research department, but I'm also a naturalist on board the Pacific Whale Foundation vessels. But my research here at the Pacific Whale Foundation is more marine debris based. So the first study that I'm going to talk about today is our new reevaluation of a study that we did in 2014 to find where Maui's marine debris accumulates the most, where on the island. So it was between three different study sites that we cleaned on a monthly basis on the north shore, the south shore, and the west side of the island. So we did find out throughout doing monthly surveys of these beaches that environmental factors play a huge role on where debris accumulates on Maui and where it washes ashore. So environmental factors that made the most difference were wind and current. So the wet, the north side of the island, which is not in the lee, but the windward side of the island did collect the most marine debris. And that was mainly due to its proximity to the subtropical convergence zone and the heavy trade winds that we get on this side of the island. So with the current and the trade winds in full force on the north side of the island, we get a huge accumulation of marine debris. On average, we were collecting about 1,400 pieces of marine debris a day on the north shore of the island. Now, if this, if we were to take this amount, 1,400 pieces of marine debris in a 100 meter section, which is the section that we cleaned at each site, if you were to take that and account that for all of the beaches in Maui. So if you made that the same, you would collect all, throughout all of Maui, that would amount to 3.1 million pieces of marine debris washing on our shores a day. And if you were to do that per month, that would be 93.3 million pieces of marine debris washing ashore a month, and then 1.1 billion pieces of debris washing ashore a year. So this marine debris accumulation is a huge issue for us. Now, during this study, this was done in 2014, in the middle of this study, Maui County actually banned all tobacco use in Maui County parks, recreational areas, and beaches, which leads me to the next study I'm going to talk about. So we started a conservation campaign through our NOAA Marine Debris Grant to educate the public and start a campaign about tobacco-free beaches, basically let the public know that this law was put in place in 2014. So in 2017, we took a study site at the Grand Wailea, which is on our south shore, and we were looking to see if that conservation campaign was effective. So were all of the posters in the meetings that we had and the educational pamphlets that we put out, did that make a difference in our cigarette usage on our beaches? Now, all of that data was done throughout 2017. We compared two different, um, we had two different sites or two different control groups. So the first 45 days of the study at the Grand Wailea, we surveyed a 100 meter section of the beach and we basically were just looking for cigarette butts. We just counted all the cigarette butts with no, any pamphlets, no signage about the law anywhere throughout the Grand Wailea. So that was our control. And then the next 45 days, we surveyed the same 100 meters, except now we had TV ads throughout the entire Grand Wailea talking about the no tobacco. And then we also had pamphlets at key sites along the beaches, near the pools, just informing guests about the ban that happened in 2014. Now the numbers are still being run. We're trying to see if there was a drop in cigarette butt use with all the educational material out. This study just ended on December 30th, 2017. So we're still in the process of getting all of those numbers out, but that'll be up next is seeing if there was a difference in the campaign and see if it helped or if we need to do more education to get the word out that there is no smoking on any of our Maui County beaches, parks or recreational areas. Oh, very interesting. Um, that sounds like really interesting and important work. 
Uh, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Jens, and he's going to talk about his research topic, and then we'll get back and do some Q&A with, um, with all the presenters. But Jenny, I have some questions for you. Hi, my name is Jens Curry. I'm the Senior Research Analyst here at Pacific Well Foundation. I um, had the privilege to study here in Maui for the last five years. I'm going to talk to you about two of you know, our top studies and two of my most favorite studies, actually. Uh, the first one's on fossil killer whales in the Maui Four Island region. Um, just to give you a bit of background, there's three populations of fossil killer whales in the North Pacific. There's a pelagic population, a Northwest Hawaiian Island population, as well as a main Hawaiian Islands insular population. And this latter population was listed as endangered in 2012. Um, because of low numbers and the potential for a decrease in the population to functional extinction by 2075. The most recent estimate of the population is 151 individuals. And the species has been studied on an, uh, sorry, a statewide level. Um, but what we're focusing on is the use of false killer whales uh, in the Maui Four Island region. Um, so since 1996, we've been documenting the occurrence of false killer whales within the Maui Four Island region focusing mainly on photo ID of those dorsal fins, which we can use to identify unique individuals. Um, and since 1996, we've identified 82 individuals, of which 32 were recites, which indicates some sort of um, reciting rate or high reciting rate within the areas or preference for the Maui Four Island region of some of those individuals. And what we're hoping to do is determine how and when fossil killer whales utilize the Maui Four Island region. And so we're looking to answer questions whether they prefer shallow waters or deeper waters. Or what are they doing when they're in here? Are they feeding within this area? Are they just transiting through? Are they just milling through? And so through this long-term research, we can begin to answer those questions. And we're actually renewing our permit this year. Uh, hopefully bringing in some new technologies to study those false killer whales and, and learn a bit more about them. The other study I'd like to talk about is whale vessel collisions. Um, so. With the recovering of some humpback whale populations, specifically uh, humpback whales here, which have been removed from the endangered species list, which is a great accomplishment, but it also means there's increasing numbers of humpback whales in our waters. Uh, and when we have increasing recreational use of our waters, it sort of has a, a recipe there for um, potential for risk to those whales through whale vessel collisions. And if we look at the numbers since 1975, there's been 80 confirmed whale vessel collisions in Hawaii uh, with 70% of those occurring since 2007. Um, ship strikes are one of the leading mortality, human-induced mortality events to whales, so we know it's an issue. And so we focused on what's that issue here in the Maui Four Island region again, uh, located largely within the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. And our main goal was to look at what factors increase whale vessel collisions, but the specific answer we wanted to provide was what is the safe travel speed for all those vessels utilizing the area on a daily basis. So for four years, we traveled in our research vessel at different speeds between five and 20 knots. And we looked at how the encounter rate, sorry, the encounter distance changed with speed and weather and different environmental conditions. And we used this encounter distance as a proxy for whale vessel collisions. And doing some model, we can begin to defer or uh, make some conclusions on what safe travel speeds might be. So that study has concluded. So we have those numbers that I'm happy to share with you today. Um, so what we did find is there's a speed threshold at 12 and a half knots where we see a significant um, decrease in close encounters or potential vessel collisions. And the exact number is a 3.4 fold decrease if you travel 12 and a half knots or less, uh, or a 340% increase if you're traveling at speeds 12 and a half knots or more. So it's a very significant change in your rate of encounters depending on the speed that you're traveling. We also found a seasonal component uh, with higher risk during the peak season, January, February, and March. Not surprising, but it sort of um, helps us guide when we should put certain speed restrictions into place. And this number of 12 and a half knots is actually quite interesting because if you look at all the other research that focuses on whale vessel collisions, this 12 and a half knots or 13 knot speed always seems to come up. Uh, so if we look actually back to the 19th century, and when we first started to see fatal collisions of whales and vessels, it was actually at the time or era when vessels could exceed speeds of 12 and a half to 13 knots. And if we look at previous research that looked at the mortality rate um, from vessel speed uh, and collisions, 
So you see that number 12 and a half knots or 13 knots pop up again, where you have a significant increase in mortality from vessels traveling speeds of 12 and a half, 13 knots or more. And finally, if you look at some of the large whale vessel uh, collision databases that are available, specifically the ones um, from NOAA, 80% uh, of those collisions or those records consists of collisions with whales at speeds in excess of 12 and a half knots. Um, so this 12 and a half knot or 13 knot speed limit or significant drop in encounter rate that we observed certainly lines up with previous research. It certainly warrants um, us traveling at speeds of 12 and a half knots or less uh, within the wild fire in the region as well as elsewhere based on all of this data that seems to be favoring this 12 and a half to 13 knot threshold. Excellent. Okay, thank you for that introduction. And again, we'll um, come back with some questions about your project. I just want to introduce our last speaker first. Um, but as a reminder, for those of you who are viewing this chat live, you can ask questions. Um, there's a chat bar just to the right of your video screen, and you can submit your questions, and our researchers will answer them live for you. Uh, you can also email events at pacificwhale.org if you have a question you'd like us to talk about. So my next speaker is Dr. Christina Castro, and she is the director of Pacific Whale Foundation Ecuador. Uh, so we're very happy to have her with us today. And Christina, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course. Hola a todos. Uh, hello for everybody. My name is Christina Castro. I am Ecuadorian. I am a researcher. I have been working with humpback whales uh, for 22 years. I am part of Pacific Way Foundation in Ecuador for 18 years. And when we was our research project, I am very, very young. I was a student with many dreams. And we know we have a breeding area for humpback whales in Ecuador, but never we have uh, the resource how we create a big project in Ecuador. Ecuador, for everybody, is a small country situated in the US Pacific in South America, in the Pacific East. It is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, having four natural regions, the coast, the highlands, with volcanos, and the jungle, and Galapagos Island is part of my country. For many, many years, the coast, is the, is the region um, with the highest poverty rates in the nation. It's very, very poor people. And I can see with my eyes how the way change the life of the old people on the coast because we have the chance, we have the opportunity to create tourist programs, tourist tours, well-reaching tours in Ecuador, and the people have work change the life, have opportunities for education, and we create a research program. For, for many, many uh, years, we can see how uh, our population is the most important population in the Pacific East. We have now, for example, a thousand of ways identified for the tails. Each humble whale has different marks, uh, scars, pigmentations on the tails, similar with our fingerprints. And we have the first catalog in South America with a thousand of whales identified for the tail. I am so proud that we hear, hear our experience. Um, I know there are a lot of people here who love the whales with the same passion that we did. We um, I create all my life around the waves in my country. Um, maybe the people don't know that in Ecuador or other South American countries for the women, it's so difficult. It's so, so difficult to study, to do research, and nobody thinks we are smart. And uh, I think so. This is a good chance for share our experience with the people love whales. And of course, I like to speak more. We have more time, but I am a doctor now. And uh, I am part of the International Whaling Commission. I represent my country 
uh, in the scientific committee. Sometimes I am part of my government too in the tourists. I am director of different positions in my government too, because the way is, is everything for the cause for our uh, environment, economic environment. And I hope so. This is a good opportunity for share our experience. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And can you tell us a little bit about um, why is Ecuador important for the humpback whales? Of course, Ecuador is a breeding area for humpback whales. This breeding area named G for the International Whaling Commission is from Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Panama. Ah, the difference is we are in Machalilla National Park around Isla de la Plata, uh, the Silver Island. And this is a concentration area for humpback whales. You can see in this area, not only babies, calves, it's possible to see for four or five months, um, the whales is a uh, behaviors. And when you see one humpback whale bridge, it's possible you see the same time tame around you with different groups. It's a concentration area, and this is the difference. Each year, the humpback whales migrate from the Antarctic, from the south, around 7,000 of kilometers to Ecuador, only for uh, falling in love and, and take a baby. <laughs> and it's so, so, so very important area because this area is where the whales warm. And now it's a national park, and in Ecuador, the whales create other national parks too. First was Machalillo National Park. Now we have five more marine areas for protect whales, because in Ecuador we find other places we find whales with concentration areas. And uh, now we uh, we have in our what we try to do in Ecuador. We try to know know more about the humpback whales, if they migrate, if the whales are combat. Uh, of course, we work with other cetacean too. For example, we have brutal whales, we have different species of dolphins, spotted dolphins, common dolphins, bottlenose dolphins they, from the coast, from the oceans uh, of the ocean, and all time, for many years, for 18 years, we have data of everything about whales. Now the people say we are on the way queen because we have all data about whale in Ecuador and we share it with everybody. And of course, in the International Whaling Commission, because everybody needs to know what happened in our country. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Jenny, I'd like to come back and ask you some follow-up questions. Okay. So the question that was submitted to us uh, by email is, what is the most commonly littered item you found on your marine debris surveys? That is a great question. The most commonly littered marine debris item, where broadly 88% of it was plastics, but out of all of that plastic, the most common piece of litter were our cigarette butt filters which do include plastics and they're extremely harmful to our environment, not only leaching those plastics into our marine environment, but also harmful chemicals that can cause adverse effects in our oceans and for our animals. And so that is becoming a huge problem, which is why we started this tobacco free campaign to see if we can get that reduction of cigarette butts on our Maui County beaches. And do you see a different composition in the debris types based on where around Maui you're surveying? We do. So more on the north shore or the north side where we did see the most accumulation of marine debris, most of that plastic were hard plastics. So slightly bigger pieces of plastics, but also small pieces like water bottle caps and stuff like that. Hard plastics where on our south side of the island is where we saw a lot of our cigarette butt filters and that was mostly the plastics which do fall under plastics that was the most marine debris that we did see okay excellent 
Excellent. Um, uh, Jens, I have a question for you next. So why are the false killer whales named false killer whales? Yeah, so if you've ever seen a false killer whale or a photo of a false killer whale, um, they look nothing like uh, the orca. So um, it's kind of curious why they call it the false killer whale, since they look nothing like a killer whale. Um, this actually originates from the initial identification of a false killer whale's skull, which uh, resembled that of a killer whale, and therefore was initially mistakenly identified as a false killer whale's skull, being the creative scientists that uh, were available at the time decided to just name it a false killer whale. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and someone has submitted a question asking, how often do we see false killer whales here around Maui? Are they commonly seen or are they more rare? Yeah, so I, I would classify them as a more rare sighting when you compare it to spotted dolphins, spinner dolphins, and bottlenose dolphins, for example, which we see fairly regularly. Um, interestingly enough, we've actually had a, quite a reduction in our sighting frequency um, from our research vessel over the last two years. We've actually seen quite a large drop in, in encounter frequency of false killer whales. Um, we do know that they occur more predominantly in some offshore waters, so our, our research starting hopefully later this year will actually focus on heavier sampling of those offshore areas um, to see if we're just missing them potentially um, within our current set survey area. If we look on our eco tour vessel, so pack whale eco cruises, uh, they actually document all the sightings of cetaceans that they encounter, uh, and they're at their 365 days a year, so you know, a pretty good metric of how often they are within the closer waters of the Maui Four Island region. And on average, they sight them about 20 times per year. Uh, when you compare that to spinner dolphins, for example, of several hundred sightings a year, uh, you can see that it's, it's this relatively rare sighting within the Maui Four Island region, specifically in those shallower waters. Okay, excellent. Um, I do have a question that's come in uh, on the YouTube chat, and it really applies to all of you. So maybe you can discuss the different areas. So the question is, what is the impact of things like pollution and climate change and changing oceans? What effect is that going to be having on humpback whales around the world? Christina, would you like to answer that? Of course, um, for many years we saw, for example, um, in Ecuador it's different. I explain you. The marine pollution, for example, it's so bad for us. We don't have the the principal. It's different to us because we don't have, for example, water very clean, or or we don't have electricity sometimes, and. Uh, uh, the humpback whales each year, when we take our photos, we find more humpback whales with different skin disease. The skin disease sometimes is more close to the marine pollution, to the weather, climate change, for example. And you can see different skin disease uh, on the humpbacks show what happened with our world. And sometimes we, we have a paper about this one. When we find, for example, a lobomycosis, lobomycosis is a fungi skin disease, uh, the lobomycosis eating the skin of the whales. And why lobomycosis is in Ecuador? Because it's a fungi from, the, from us, from the humans. It's because our um, bad water, I don't know the, the English word, our water from the houses, from the companies, going direct to the water. And they take everything in the skin of the waves, you know? This is so bad. And happens in South America, because we don't have a lot of laws about the environment. And it's possible to see the change of the waves. Uh, we have a lot of whales each year, a lot of cases with the skin disease, provocate for the humans. Okay, that's very sad. Um, Jens, do you have anything you'd like to add about what you're seeing here in Hawaii? Yeah, so I mean, if you're an avid whale watcher or, or um, resident of the Maui Far Island region, you'll know that um, 
over the past few years, there's been a large fluctuation in a number of whale sightings, mostly anecdotal evidence, but it, it, it shows that um, the whales certainly will evolve uh, to changing climates as needed and the influence that we'll have specifically for us conducting research here is still relatively unknown, but it's certainly going to be an interesting aspect to study, whether it's uh, we see a shifting of food source and therefore shifting in migration patterns of the humpback whales, is that there are all potentials of, of global warming and climate change. Um, another immediate impact of pollution that we see is in the form of, of marine debris, in that we have quite a large number of entanglements uh, with marine debris here for um, humpback whales within the Maui Four Island region. So far this year, there's already been 11 confirmed cases of, of entanglement with um, deer like fishing gear, marine debris nets, things like that. Uh, and you know, this is all things that we need to consider when, when we're talking about pollution and climate change. Yeah, so that ties into Jenny and your work. So what can people do about marine debris? It affects the land, it affects the oceans, it's affecting everyone and all of the animals. So what do you suggest that people do to help this marine debris problem? Yeah, so there's a lot of things you can do, whether you're out on the water, just maybe in a kayak or on a personal boat. If you guys do happen to see any marine debris, I really encourage you, if it's safe and conditions are right, to just grab it, try and get it out of the water, put it on your vessel and then properly dispose of it in a trash can or near a dumpster when you get back on shore. That really does help picking up these ghost nets that Jens was talking about or any of these derelict marine debris that could possibly harm our humpback whales. It's really imperative to get that out of the water. Also trying just to reduce and reuse and recycle. Basically what you guys learned in elementary school really does make a difference. So reducing any of your waste in general will help have and to reduce this marine debris. Also, I encourage you guys, if you're out on the beach, just pick up five pieces of marine debris throw it in the trash or recycle it if it's possible. There's a ton of water bottles you find on the beach. If you're picking up any cigarette butts, you can dispose of them as well. Hawaii does have some recycling programs that we go through. We do have actually a cigarette butt recycling program that we do here at the Pacific Whale Foundation where we get Terrace Cycle, which is a company on the mainland to help reduce and recycle our cigarette butt use but just by reducing, reusing, and recycling, and then picking up any marine debris you find, just taking five minutes out of your day when you're at the beach to make it a little bit better is a great way to help reduce your marine debris. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was a question that was submitted on the YouTube chat. Uh, would you like to talk a bit about what kind of infrastructure for recycling marine debris or just recycling in general exists here on Maui? I can switch it up a bit, Jenny. Um, so for marine debris recycling, there's actually nothing, no infrastructure on the island um, in a broad sense. Uh, there is the net to energy program uh, where you can deposit um, nets into uh, large trash bins and then they'll be collected and that'll be burned and used to create energy. Unfortunately, there's no receptacle for that on Maui at this point, but some of the other islands certainly have that in play. So it's a good resource um, for disposing of those large nets as opposed to just adding them to the landfill, for example. As far as other hard plastics, uh, Maui County only recycles type one and two plastics, um, as well as H5 um, cans, plastic bottles, uh, things like that. So there is quite a bit of room for improvement in the amount of plastics that they can actually take, which will directly um, relate to a reduction in the amount of plastics we probably see in, in, as debris um, within the Maui Four Island region. Uh, interestingly here is um, a, a ban on plastic bags that was sort of at the corporate structure which prevented, um, you know, food land, lawns, places like that from actually distributing uh, plastic bags or single-use plastic bags. Uh, to their customers and when we do our beach surveys we actually find zero plastic bags um, on those beach cleanups which is very promising and shows that you know, if there's an uptake of these new policies then you can have some very good success in reducing your marine debris. Uh, reverse that to the cigarette butt ban uh, where there's no really corporate responsibility it's reliable on the end user to sort of be responsible and aware of their impact. Um, we actually have seen no real significant reduction in cigarette butts at any of our beaches, um, county parks, and recreational areas. 
Jenny, you can add to that if you'd like. Sure, so there are companies out there that are trying to help this problem in accordance with the Pacific Whale Foundation. We do beach cleanups almost on a monthly basis here with other corporations like the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Hawaii or Malama Maui Nui also does a bunch of beach cleanups as well. International Beach Cleanup Day happens every year here on Maui. So it really is a community effort. Also, I have personally been starting to see, especially in Lahaina or the west side of Hawaii, a lot of restaurants switching to paper straws, trying to get rid of that plastic straw since they are on the water line on Front Street, right near the ocean. I know Monkey Pod, Down the Hatch, a couple of other restaurants are really looking into switching over or have already done switching to those paper straws. So definitely the community is becoming more aware of it and Maui being such high respect for Aloha for the island, we all love our beaches, our parks, our waters, and we all wanna do our part to help these whales and our marine debris. So everybody, or most people are really trying to make it a better place and making those initiatives to help reduce all of our waste and switching over to better alternatives. Yeah, that's interesting. You brought up drinking straws. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit and talk about why plastic drinking straws are starting to get a lot of attention in the conservation world? Yeah, so plastic drinking straws are basically the poster child for single-use plastics. They're really taking a stride right now. We're hearing a lot more about them on the mainland in the U.S., also down here in Maui. So plastic drinking straws in the U.S. alone we use 500 million straws a day. And this is, you're probably using more than one straw a day. You get a new one with every drink if you go out and you're using that straw for maybe 10 minutes at most. And straws are really quite lightweight that they, it's really hard to get them into the recycling facility. So not a lot of them make it into the recycling unit and they just kind of end up on our beaches. They're actually one of the top 10 marine debris items found during beach cleanups worldwide. So it's not just a US problem. It really is becoming a global issue. And it does affect our marine animals. It can harm them. They can ingest them. They can get them stuck in places. And it does affect our beaches as well. So it's becoming a huge problem. There, there is becoming more awareness. And there's a couple of things you can do to reduce your straw use. One is just to refuse the straw when you go out on your, at a bar, a restaurant, a cafe. It might sound weird at first and your waiter or waitress might not quite get it. But usually they're pretty understanding and they give you a big thumbs up for thinking about the sea turtles and the whales and the dolphins out there who can be harmed by these plastic straws. So if you just say, hold the straw, the next time you guys go out, you can really reduce those plastic straws. If you really do need that straw, I know there are certain instances where we just need that straw. They do make reusable forms. So I have about five stainless steel straws that I keep in each one of my bags. That's why I always have one on hand with me and I don't need that plastic straw. They also come in paper, bamboo. I know there's a company that makes potato straws. So there are alternatives out there for us to use. It's just making that effort and having that go forth to actually make the switch to more alternative um, remedies for our plastic drinking straws. Yeah, it's something that I've seen in the news a lot lately. I heard there's some uh, cities and towns that have actually banned plastic drinking straws. And it seems like Hawaii is using a plastic drinking straw ban as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so my question for each of you is, what's up next? What are you planning to focus on over the next year or two? What you your attention towards in 2000? Uh, Jens, would you like to start? Uh, I'll lead off the discussions there. Um, so yeah, we're actually at a stage at Pacific Whale Foundation in the research department where a lot of our permits are, are coming close to an end, so we have this opportunity to sort of um, develop new projects in, in emerging areas, especially in areas that, that really require it. And one of the things on the horizon for Pacific Whale Foundation is continuing our study of falls, you know, the endangered species that's right in our backyard that refocus our efforts on that. And most of our field research will be dedicated um, to again answering some more unknown questions of false killer whales in the Maui Poor Island region that I alluded to earlier. And we're also hoping to utilize some emerging technologies, new technologies, to help us better understand better understand the population within the Maui Four Island region. Um, yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. Are you continuing to do humpback whale research as well? 
Yes, of course. We will continue to do humpback whale research. Um, the direction that we're going to go with theirs is uh, probably still looking at potential impacts, anthropogenic impacts that the whales have, so that we have on the whales, and how we can potentially improve our, our operations or coexist successfully with, with the population here that's increasing every year. Okay. And to Christina, what is next for you and your research efforts in Ecuador? I heard that you have a new research project looking at the Brutus whale. Would you like to talk about that? Yes, we are working now with Bruda whales and killer whales too, really. Yeah. For example, with killer whales, we find uh, one orca. It uh, was in Ecuador for many years. Each year, coming for the humpback baby. Uh, we have many times we can all evidence that we need. Uh, we have videos about how the attacks of the killer whales with humpbacks. And in our last meeting in South America with other researchers, we find the same orca is in Peru with the same behavior, was in Mexico with the same behavior, and possible in Galapagos. We need to check the last photos. And it's so interesting because with our research, it's possible to find more data and know more about other species. In Bruda Wales, uh, the last year, we present the first catalog, the first whale identified for the dorsal fin in Ecuador. But we uh, share our efforts with Peru, with Panama, and with Colombia. And we find Bruda are in Ecuador, later are in Peru, and later are in Panama, moved in this area. And this is so interesting because nobody knows a lot about Ruda whales. It's so, they are species so fast. We don't know is the, what is the migrate areas. We know this is small migrate areas, but we are not sure what happened. And we, this year, we continue with our do the whale research. We try to get samples for worse with the genetic. And of course, we try to know which species, because we have two subspecies. There are brides, and there are brides with the humpback whales. It's a Balanoptera brides and Balanoptera edemi. And we think that we have Balanoptera brides in Ecuador. And I think so, it's so interesting because when we are reading about the, our whaling books, or all books about whales, the whaling books say in Ecuador, in Isla de la Plata, is a whaling area. They have a lot of fin whales and bruda whales. Now, never I saw fin whales, for example. And when we're talking in the International Whaling Commission, we say, we are in front of the population increase, increase in Ecuador. And we are the, the, the bear, we, we are part of this one. And the International Women Commission should be create a research program to protect this population, try to increase and that before in these areas, you know? Each year is very common. We find Bruda waves in January, in December, January, and February. And happens in Peru the same one, happens in Panama the same ones. And of course, our plans is know more about these species and create rulers and public stations management for our countries. Our government need to know what happened in the ocean. Part or protect these species and this population that we don't know nothing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jenny, would you like to talk about what's next for you and the new campaign that you're going to be starting this year? Yeah, so we here at the Pacific Whale Foundation are going to launch a no plastic drinking straw campaign. So back to all that straw information I was telling you earlier. So we're going to launch the official campaign on all our vessels and in our stores on April 22nd, this coming 2018, which is actually Earth Day. 
And we're trying just to educate people on plastic drinking straws and the damage that they do to our marine environment as pollution and marine debris. So it's gonna be multifaceted. So in any of our retail stores in Ma'alaya and Lahaina, we're gonna have a petition for anybody who walks into that store to petition to stop using plastic straws. It's just a fun way to get you thinking about switching over and not using plastic straws or refusing the straw when you're out at a restaurant. You can sign a petition, but also in the store, we're gonna try and have reusable straws for you guys for purchase and sale. So possibly stainless steel or bamboo options. We haven't quite decided yet, but we'll have those available for you to purchase in the store. That way you can use it while you're on vacation, wherever you go and have a drink and you want a straw. And it's something you can bring back home with you to keep that trend going, to keep that petition promise. We're also gonna do this campaign aboard any of our Pacific Whale Foundation vessels. So throughout April and especially on April 22nd, we're gonna have educational information on our vessels, our naturalists are all gonna help educate you guys on plastic straws. They'll be there for any questions that you have and how you can make it even better and how you can reduce your marine debris use and your plastic straw use and possibly have reusable straws for sale on our vessels as well. That way you can get it instantly. You can use it in that Mai Tai or soda or water you have while you're on board. Start that eco initiative right off the bat give you a nice souvenir to take off the boat with you and back home. And just, you can sign the petition there as well. If you wanna sign up, say you're gonna stop using straws while you're here and something you bring home on the mainland with you as well. Awesome, that's really exciting. Um, really looking forward to it. So for those of you who are watching, just a reminder that you can submit questions on our YouTube chat. You can also email them to the email at pacificwhales.org. Uh, so, Christina, I have one last question for you. Is the whale watching in Ecuador in the boat industry? And uh, can you discuss what are the rules, what is the, the regulations around whale watching in the part of the world? Thank you so much. Uh, for the question. Um, of course, the world is in Ecuador for housing and other populations that are in free school. Temporary, uh, 15 years ago, we have maybe three stores, maybe three restaurants. When the Lopez, the Lopez, the village, the fishing town, the fishing village. Uh, is the bamboo houses without cars 15 years ago and um, very, very beautiful inside of Machaliana. But we don't have, we don't have to, for example, for study, for going to the school, the woman, the woman, it's very, very, very young because it's our local systems. We don't have opportunity. And with the way we can change everything because the people open their eyes, open their eyes. Yeah. we have opportunity. Maybe it's good in my daughter, my daughter get married very young and going to the school. And for 15 years now, for example, the last year, we had a yeah. and we have only to September is our breeding area from June to September each year. We have the last year 80,000 of people going to see whales. And in only in one town in Puerto Lopez. This means around four million of dollars direct of humpback, for Puerto Lopez for humpback whales. This changed everything. The view is so beautiful too, but we don't have more bamboo houses. We have very good restaurants. We have very tour operators who speak English. And uh, we have very um, hotels, many, maybe 60 hotels we have now. And it's a tourist destiny for Ecuador. The, the, for example, we are so proud and celebrate each year our Hamba Whale Festival, each June 22. And our government, government in 2008 declared the Whale Day for Ecuador, each June 22. 
Then in our well festival, we have four regions from the jungle, the people from the highlands, with our dance, with our food, and say only, welcome whales. This means for us, welcome the humble whales is around now in June. And of course, the whale watching, uh, we have many, many rulers. We have our first love I like to share with everybody. In 2001, Greg Kaufman was in my country and he changed everything. He show us, he teach us how create uh, tourists. For example, uh, we create, we have a lot of problems, everybody with everybody, with the government, and he write the first law. He say, no, you need a rulers, you need a, a, need a know how many meters you need to be the boat, the whales, for example, I remember. The engines, you need to be the engines in neutral, no turn off the engines because the whale need to know where are. He's told about the training courses for our guides. The guide need to know everything about whales. And our first training course is with Greg. And of course, I, I am so sad, but I'm so proud because he constructed, he built, sorry, he built many things in our country. When you think about Pacific Way Foundation, maybe you don't know is really Pacific Way Foundation with you take a tour with Pacific Way Foundation or when you do a donations for research is true. Because we have projects in Ecuador with this money, we have projects in Chile with blue waves with this money, we have projects in Australia, and with the information we create ways for conservation, for protect these waves. There are many people in the world try to do something with the waves, but there are no no projects, there are no people believing in you. And Greg Kaufman and Pacific Forest Foundation believe in us and change everything. We have thousands, thousands of ways identified in Ecuador, thousands of papers and workshops. We share our experience with everybody. And only we do it with Pacific Way Foundation. I was so sad, of course, what happened now, but I am so glad because we build a big project in my country and never stop now. <laughs> Well, since we've been on the topic of whale watching regulations, I'd like to tie it back to Jens's research project about the speed limits and what's a safe speed to travel around a humpback whale. So Jens, can you talk a bit about um, how those results are used and how they're um, applied in, in practical world? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Greg definitely was a big proponent of getting people out to see the whales, but but doing it in a responsible and safe manner um, for those whales. So he developed the Be Whale, a Pro Be Whale Aware program here at Pacific Whale Foundation, and um, we sort of wanted to put some science behind that, and it was the real drive behind our initial um, studying of whale vessel collisions within the Maui Four Island region. Um, again, trying to answer that main question of what is that safe travel speed um, within the area. So based on our research, we've actually updated our B-Whale Aware program to have all of our pack whale eco-cruise vessels traveling at um, 15 knots in November, December, and April, and 12 and a half knots during January, February, and March. And that's based on the data that we've collected over the past four years, which shows that seasonal aspect as well as showing that there's a significant increase in potential for whale vessel collisions when traveling at 12 and a half knots or more. Um, so that's sort of um, how that ties into the Be Whale Aware program. And it's a similar program that we've carried over to Australia Ecotour operations as well, um, using this safe operating procedures around humpback whales to ensure respectable viewing distances are um, maintained but um, as much as the public can get out to appreciate and experience these um, amazing 
animals, such as humpback whales. Okay, we just got a really good question in the chat uh, about photo ID. So all of the projects that we're talking about today, the false killer whale study, the humpback whale studies in Hawaii, the humpback whale studies in Australia, humpback whale studies in Ecuador, we all rely on photo identification to identify individual animals. So would one of you like to explain how that works? What, what does it mean that we can identify individuals based on a dorsal fin or based upon a tail fluke? How exactly does that process work? Yeah, I mean, I like to use the analogy of that, uh, you know, a lot of our species come with natural tags that um, are with them for their life. So um, if you look at humpback whales, it's the underside of the fluke, unique to each individual and no two alike. And you can use the pigment pattern as well as those ridges along that trailing edge to identify an individual. Um, for humpback whales, you are required for the whale to fluke up. Um, so we always get extra excited when we see the arched back and then we know that the fluke is coming up and we actually um, take a photograph of those um, flukes and that's actually what we use to identify an individual. Um, for adenosites or, or dolphins, a little different when we use the dorsal fins um, and we use the notches in the mix out of the backside of, or the trailing edge of the dorsal fin to again identify them. We don't actually put tags on the whales here or the dolphins here at Pacific Whale Foundation. Currently we are relying on these um, basically permanent tags in the form of, of dorsal fins and, and flukes to maintain long-term records um, for the basic fact that a tag really can't be applied to an animal for life, but a dorsal fin and a fluke can stay with the animal for the life. True, yeah. Uh, Christina, would you like to talk about that and the methods that you're using? Of course, um, the dorsal fin or the tail fluke has different smart indentations. And um, it's so good because with the camera, with the photos, you take a photo and you can know who is who. We use, for example, in Ecuador, the whale watching boat, such as our research platform. When the people get the tours, we put one researcher, one volunteer in the boats, and we have more chances to get the information. Then, for example, in one day, we have three or four people in different boats with different groups. Then we get more information. We do it all day for three or four months. And each year, it's possible to identify three or four hundred of whales. And then, for example, in Ecuador, we have the 10% of the whales come back to Ecuador each year, the 10 and to 15%. And we found whales, for example, in Ecuador, in Puerto Lopez, and we recapture with the same photo. What means recapture? Means the same tail, the same fluke is in other country. Other researchers do the same methodology, get photo, get photo ID with the tail and fluke. And we find our whales in Costa Rica, in Panama, and now we find a whale 10,000 of kilometers from Ecuador in the island, Sandwich Islands. Sandwich Islands is the feeding area for Hamba whales from Brazil and, for example, to Africa. Yes, and only with the photo ID and words with the whale watching tools, it's possible to get this information. Okay, so we're getting near the end of our time. I have one last question and I'd like um, each of you to come up with an answer, but I'll give you a minute to think about it. So my question to you is, um, for people watching or for people more interested in becoming involved in our conservation or education or research programs at Pacific Whale Foundation, what can members of the public do? What can they do to help? Um, so I'll give you a minute to think about that and while you're thinking I just want to mention that there's a couple of events coming up soon so uh, if you want to become a bit more involved with the mission at Pacific Whale Foundation or hear more from our researchers we're going to be at um, the Whale Film Festival this Friday in Ka'anapali uh, there's a couple of short films about marine debris about whales uh, whaling it's gonna be a really interesting night and we're hosting a gala event this Saturday. It's our first 
time doing this type of gala event. We're really excited about it. We're going to be raising money to donate to researchers in um, different parts of the world, studying five populations that are very endangered. Uh, one of those is the false killer whales in Hawaii. Uh, and one of them is the blue whales of Chile that Pacific Whale Foundation has been involved with for a long time. And some of them are new collaborations for us. So if you'd like to attend either of those events, you can email events at pacificwhale.org or go to mauiwhalefestival.org. Um, so got that spiel over with. Um, Jenny, would you like to talk about how the public can get involved? Oh, I think your microphone's muted. So there's a great way that you guys can get involved while you're out here on vacation, and that's through our volunteer on vacation program. So if you go to any Pacific Whale Foundation store, whether that be in Ma'alai or Lahaina, you can actually get your own beach cleanup bag. We give you a little cleanup bag along with some gloves and a data sheet. And if you guys can go to any beach of your choosing and clean up the beach for as long or as short as you want. And just well, all we ask is that you take some data down and then you hand that back into the Pacific Whale Foundation, you actually get a gift for completing this. It's a great way to get you guys out on the beach, which you're probably already visiting anyway, doing some good marine debris cleanup and then giving that back, which is valuable information for us that we put in our database and that way we can monitor our marine debris along our beaches. Awesome. Uh, Jens, would you like to go next? Sure. I mean, in a broad sense, I think we can all play a role in becoming advocates for conservation and research and, and protection of, of those resources that are specifically at risk. So it doesn't necessarily need to be with the PWF or Pacific Well Foundation. It, it can be on your own, but if you're looking to get more involved with us specifically, our volunteer on vacation program, as Jenny mentioned, is uh, really good, um, but we could also uh, have people more directly involved with the foundation. If you are, for example, a young undergrad or a recent undergraduate, um, you could certainly apply for our internship programs in the research department, which is open year round. And it gives you an opportunity to train with us and actually conduct research side by side um, on whales and dolphins both on the water, as well as at various land stations and, and doing the data side of it as well uh, within the office. Um, the other thing I could mention that we recently launched is Whale and Dolphin Tracker. This is a citizen science platform for monitoring cetacean populations. Uh, to date, we're hovering around 50,000 odd sightings of cetaceans using this platform. And it allows the public to get involved and in that they could track their, uh, their trips and see what whales they've sighted when they've come out with PWF or other vessels, for example. Um, but it's a great app and a great resource um, to help monitor Cetacean populations both here in, in Hawaii as well as elsewhere. Excellent. Yeah, and that app is available to download now, right? Yeah, it's free of charge, um, open to the public. All the sightings that you log are your sightings to, to keep in your profile and, and sort of look back next year if you want to see when and where you saw a whale or a dolphin. Excellent. And Christina, any remarks from you about how people can get involved? In Ecuador? Of course. Uh, we have our volunteers programs research for one day. Um, Pacific Web Foundation uh, donated each year for our project, uh, our cameras and our materials. But with the people is involved in our research, such as volunteers, it's possible to create more, of course. We get more data. And uh, we have our way house in Ecuador too. And uh, we are so glad to answer any question that you may have about our volunteers or internship programs. We have a house, we have a boat, and we work with the tourist boats in Ecuador. And all people is welcome because uh, with our project, it's possible to share, to help, and of course, know more about us. Okay. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in to this uh, 2018 edition of Chat with the Experts.
If you'd like to ask any follow-up questions or like some more information about what we discussed today, you can visit our website, that's pacificwhale.org, or you can email the research department, that's research at pacificwhale.org, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you.